So in the university system, you have math, you have whatever the subject areas may happen to be, you have philosophy, but then you also have a parallel architecture that's been set up in which, insert word, studies is set up, gender studies. And so gender studies isn't merely the study of gender, it's the study of the study of gender. And this, these fields, if, and that's really among the most generous thing one could say about them, these fields operate by their own rules, they have their own methodologies, they have their own ways that they advance. So for example, one thing that they use is lived experience. Mm. In the literature it's called standpoint epistemology. So we all have our own lived experience and we need to, a word they're very fond of, privilege certain sorts of life experiences. So we can, I can never as a cis white heterosexual male experience the, the, or have access to the lived experience of somebody who has more oppression variables than I have. Mm. So to understand that, we need a field of study, critical, study, critical race theory, critical studies. Mm. Which is just, it's interesting, by the way, at Portland State University, there was an event in which white people could attend but couldn't ask questions. So it was a listening event. <laughs> and, 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 what could possibly go wrong? But telling people to shut up based on their skin color. First of all, I was amazed that that was legal at a public mm. institution. Mm. So, so a, a long story short, I found out that it was legal, but it was inadvisable because if you do that, then you could create another event for for white people where black people could attend, but they weren't allowed to speak. One of the most interesting things about this attempt to section off people according to group characteristics, first of all, is is that it makes a claim which is self-contradictory on its own terms. It says simultaneously, a group of people cannot understand another group of people because they have not had the same lived experience. And it simultaneously says, but you must devote your life to trying to do so. Right. It's what I've described as the, you must understand me, you will never understand me conundrum. But the the moral evil, it seems to me, underneath it is this, is that if I cannot understand somebody who's black and somebody who's Asian cannot understand me and I can't understand a straight person and a straight person can't understand me and on and on and none of us who are male can understand women and, and so then it's unclear how we should aspire to communicate in our lives. Yeah. And it's right. unclear why we would bother to read or talk or think across lines. Right. It says we must be stuck in our silo. Mm. I must only read gay, white, male literature, because although I could try to read literature by other people, uh, it's really not worth it because I'll never understand it. That suggests that we as human beings can never get beyond whatever trait we're born with. It's profoundly anti-human. And we know we know that that's false for a number of reasons. For example, you're gay and I'm straight, but we both know what love is. We both feel right. love. So and, and, and I think there's nothing that either of us cannot understand about the other or their point of view. Right. I don't think there's anything you could say that I would say, I just, I can't wrap my hand, head around that because I'm gay. Right. And I don't think there's anything I would say that you'd say, I just can't understand what Douglas is talking about, but it must be because I'm straight. It's, it, right. it's such on its own terms, a ludicrous and... Poisonous, it really, it poisons interactions. But we also know that that's false because we do it all the time. We construct yes. institutions. We go to the bank and make change. Yeah. We put in our order for lunch today. Yes. We don't know the gender or, or the sexual orientation of the person who took our lunch. So we, we, certainly we do it with commerce, but we do it with commerce in the broadest sense when we create systems to do these things. Yes, and it also, of course, it, 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 among other things, makes us retreat into the following problem, which is that if we can't understand each other, it's unclear how we could sort out any problem. Right. Other than through violence. Right. Because if either we can communicate successfully with each other as human beings, or communication is in some way impossible because understanding is impossible, and then what do we have other than violence? Right. Now, the, the thing that they claim to be wanting to avert is precisely the thing that they're most likely to encourage. Right. And when you think about that, well, what if someone is gay and black? Well, then 
Right. So there are ever divisions in which you can only communicate more narrowly mm. with people and who share. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and all of these things, because, as you know, the intersectionalists are, are, are fascinated by this, aren't they? Right. They, they think there's nothing so interesting right. as finding interlocking oppressions and so on. And, and this, this in the identity politics and intersectionalist game is almost the heart of the game because of the assertion that is made that all, all oppression in human existence is interweaved, that, 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 that it is all interlocked, and that if you were to address one form of oppression, you would have to address the others. So the intersectionalists say it's not good enough to address remaining misogyny in society without addressing remaining misogyny in relation to black women in yeah. society. And then it's not sufficient to address remaining misogyny against black women in society. You must fixate on black trans women in society and on and on and on. Some of which is interesting, some of which, but it's, it's a long way away from solving any problems because yeah. among, among much else, it says, this is so completely interlocked that to unweave yeah. it, to unlock it, you would solve something. And my suggestion is you can't because all of these things are more complex even on those terms. For instance, what do you do with somebody who has some of those characteristics but ducks out from another aspect of it? What, what do you do about a black woman for whom their femininity is very important to them but they don't have any interest in black issues? Or they identify as a black person, they'd, they'd rather not be reduced to being, you know, a woman. And on and on and on along this way you go. And it seems to me that it's obvious that the intersections don't all resolve and find resolution. Mm. They madden people because right. there are all these tensions which are going to exist anyway. Imagine taking that upon yourself and thinking that if you think this way, you are a better person. That to me is what is particularly maddening. It's the move from thinking about something to feeling it makes you a better person if you have this worldview. If you're constantly looking at people. In so when you walk into a store and there's a mixed race couple, that has to command a certain mm. percentage of your attention. The, 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 to steal man what they think they're doing, they think that they're correcting injustices that have existed in the past by overcorrecting in the present. Right. So they think that because it's undoubtedly true that women have not always historically been able to achieve what they should have been able to achieve by dint of being a woman, because homosexuality was criminalized until the 60s, because this country in America, like many other countries in the world, had terrible racial problems throughout a significant portion of its history, which were not resolved until, you know, the latter part of the 20th century, and some people think still not. But it suggests that because of that historic injustice, it must be rectified now by doing it the other way around, right. at least for a period of time. That's equity. Equity. So because women undoubtedly didn't always have the opportunities they should have had, we'll make up for it by insulting men now. Right. You can do the same thing on the LGBT bit, but the most obvious one, the most really rancid and divisive one now, is black people undoubtedly had oppression in the past, so we'll make white people feel like the bad ones. And I think they think, this is again, this is steel manning and attributing good motive to it. I think they think they'll only need to do it for a time. The problem is, the work is never done. The work is never done. They don't know when they'd stop. Right. They don't know who would call time. And the crucial thing is, they don't know when the overcorrection doesn't end up swinging the other way. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the question I always wonder on about this is, is it wise for the portion of feminist studies that decided that the best way to advance women is to insult men. Do they think long term it's a good strategy to try to demoralize 50% of the population? It seemed to me unwise and a hard way to get support long term. If the goal is to reach some kind of a consensus. If it's to reach a consensus. 
And the same, obviously, with racial issues. If you agree that because black people in history have been disadvantaged, is it wise, particularly in a country like America, where uh, the black population is, what, 13% of the population, is it wise to talk about the group that is the majority group still, white people, as if they are guilty beings who carry historic sin and can never be redeemed? It seems to me that if that is the, the plan in the overcorrection, I can see quite a lot of ways in which that goes wrong. Right. When I first started looking at you know, identity politics, intersectionalism and all that sort of thing, I, uh, I knew that I should try to engage with the fundamental texts. What were the foundational texts? And one of the ones I heard about a lot, it's one of the most cited texts, is uh, unpa Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Yeah. And uh, I thought when I, when I got this text, I thought, well, you know, there must be something there. It will be, a, it'll be something to contend with. And no, it's, it's a few pages of assertions right. made by this academic, uh, many of which are erroneous, uh, many of which are false, uh, provably so. Mm. And, uh, and yet this is one of the most cited texts, as if what it says is true. Mm. And, uh, and the problem with that is you set up then this hierarchy fight. And the hierarchy fight involves people having to try to work out where they stand in a privileged structure. Right all of which is unsolvable mm. because nobody can do it with one person throughout their life. Mm. Nobody can do it with everybody from one class of person throughout their life because people don't fall out like that and aren't able to be summed up like that. And you couldn't even do it hour by hour because it could change. I mean, you could have somebody who appeared to be at the very top of the hierarchy privilege pyramid who turned out, for instance, to have very serious mental problems. And you didn't know that at 12 o'clock and at one o'clock you find it out and therefore you've got to move them around in the hierarchy of oppression. Mm. Nobody worked this out because it can't be worked out. What a weight. Hmm. Like, seriously, what a weight to, to place upon someone as they walk through life to try to figure out what the oppression hierarchy is or the privilege hierarchy. Yes. I mean, just imagine like you're trying to navigate your life anyway, and then you superimpose on top of that yeah. an additional structure of grievance. Yes, uh, which which also this is, and grievance is obviously the the key word here, isn't it? Because to to teach somebody that they should feel grievance is, in my view, a quite wicked thing to do. Right. Because we all in our lives could have. Grievances. I mean, most of us do have some grievances, and um, it's not always been seen as a good thing to have. Right. It thwarts you in lots of ways. Right, right. So to be encouraged to have grievances is to set somebody off from the beginning of their life in a, in a direction which is highly likely to lead them to unhappiness. I mean, I would say that although there are legitimate grievances that people have, they sh should also be encouraged to try to reconcile themselves right. with the world, to harmonize themselves with the world, to recognize the things you can do things about and the things that you can't. The serenity prayer. Yes, absolutely. And this, uh, the reason why this, that particular bit of wisdom goes across all world mm. traditions is because it's a fundamental insight that in the same way as we know that if we see somebody on an average day and they ask how we are, we tend to say, you know, great or fine. We don't say, actually, you know, my bowels are playing up today <laughs> and I've got That's that, fortunate. that, you know, Veruca's back and right, so on. Right. Because not just because we, they may not want to know the detail, um, but because we intuit that to do so in some way would make their day worse. Mm. You know, it, it, it would not only be a selfish thing to do, it would be to spread around grievance in a world which already has a lot of unhappiness mm. and which you don't need to add to. And this is one of the fundamental things, it seems to me, that's so wicked about this project, to encourage people to be more at odds with the world than we all already are. It's a fundamental moral error. I think part of the problem with having a conversation with the end goal is that the work is never done. Part of the problem is also you can't identify the end goal because any disparity in outcome is, is just assumed to be racist. That's the de facto. It's, if there is a disparity in outcome, race has to be at the, but not in everything, not in, for example, people who collect garbage hmm. or people who have higher risks of, of death, you know, tr truckers or something, or on death, death row, which is almost exclusively male. 
So I think that the... Yes, nobody says we need more female representation on death row. That's correct. That's correct. So I think that the key here is what does it mean to have an equitable system as opposed to what it means to have an, a system in which we treat people equally? Yes. Yeah. This is the absolute heart of the issue, isn't it? Um, I mean, we could get, uh, I don't want to sound panaglossian, but we could get almost total agreement, it seems to me, in American society on the idea that people should have an equal shot in their lives. I think that's a pretty and, good aspiration. Right, and, and I will, I'll give them what they're looking for. And this is where I think many conservatives have fallen. The idea that we should, we, we can and should just pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps, that's a good idea. But it's far easier to do that if we have s systems based upon fairness. For example, it's far easier to do that if we have, everyone has a, a public education of the first rate, a la John Rawls. So the, the more there's a disparity in those starting conditions, and I would argue that it's primarily economic, which breaks down as a race as a proxy to that economic conditions. The solution to me seems to be fairness. Mm, mm. The um, equality. equality, equality of yes. opportunity as opposed to equality of outcome. Th that's what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for equity. Mm. They want to advance equity, mm. particularly the readjustment of shares as one's previous quote unquote racial history factors into it. Yes, so long as it's always in a beneficial light. I mean, this is, we are so confused as a society now on all of this, aren't we? I mean, we are so confused. Um, most people I think would hear the words equality and equity as synonyms. Right. I, I, th I think Joe Biden, in fact, in the debate, right. didn't know the meanings of those terms. I, I think. I think it's really troubling when very, very important distinctions are so little understood. Do we want an equal society? Yes, in many ways. Do we want a society where every profession has exactly the correct representation within it, depending on racial and other character traits of the general population, so that if you have less than 13% of the, of the workforce in any, any sector of the economy, you've got to... Right. We'd need some governing body to mm. mandate that, and that would separate people from their own proclivities and interests. Yes. It means that if you didn't have exactly 13% um, of black employees, right. you would have to make sure you fired some Right. employees of other races and put some black people in. It would also, of course, and this is the element that nobody ever wants to focus on, it would mean that if you had 19% of black employees in your firm, you'd have to get rid of some people who were black because they were black, because otherwise the whole racial quota system didn't work, which, of course, opens up the same thing which is highlighted by the lack of female engineers, the lack of female firefighters, and much more, which is you probably can't do that unless... It seemed to be in an area which it's desirable to be in by society at this moment, including highly remunerated jobs, high prestige jobs, and much more. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why every time that the equity discussion comes up and it's around the media or Hollywood, I just put my head in my hands because I just think that these are the least typical professions imaginable and very bad places to play what remaining equality issues there are in society out because almost nothing can be played at that level. It seems to be a bizarre way to just think about things in the first place. Mm. I think we should try to find problems that we could agree on and could solve. That's my view. For instance, I think we could agree on the following proposition across right and left, such as those boundaries exist. We could agree that, for instance, nobody in their lives should be held back from attaining a position they should or could attain, simply held back because of characteristics over which they have no say. But we could only agree with that if our starting value isn't equity. Yes, absolutely. And it would, of course, rely on 
well, I mean, there are other things. It, it keeps certain people down who don't have the ability to, to perform a task. But the one I think we could, we could agree on would be everybody capable of performing a certain task should be able to achieve that role in spite of any character traits of which they have no say. So, you know, and, and I, all the polling data in, in my own country, in the United Kingdom, like here in America, shows that there's, there's pretty much total agreement on this. Very few people still right. think that a, a woman who's the best qualified person for a right. role shouldn't get the role because she's a woman. Right. Very few people in this society now think that you know, a choice of right. two people for a job, one's white, one's black, the black person is clearly better qualified for the role, you shouldn't give him the role because he's black. There's very little of this around in our societies now, despite the catastrophizing claims of some of the social justice activists. But if we said, that's what we're aiming for, we're just aiming to get to a place yeah. where immutable characteristics do not dictate what you can achieve in your life, and and sh should not. Should not. And once we've got there, and if we're not there yet, and you could argue that we're not, but once we're there, we'd like that ground to be held. Mm. You know, we don't want any snap back on it at any point. Now, we could agree on that. The problem, the really sincere debate that is going on in our time, which we, we know we, too few people identify, is that there is a serious difference of opinion over how that is achieved. And that, broadly speaking, portions of the left say it should be achieved by forcing quota systems, for instance, on everything from universities to boards of corporations. And the right answer is, I, I say this myself, is, is, is to an extent unsatisfactory, which is to say, don't push these things because it'll, it'll, it'll come out naturally anyway, so long as the, as you say, the, the Rawlsian preconditions are in place, so long as people have got a good education, mm. they'll get there. Now, as it happens, I think both of those arguments have something to be said for them. But if you only believe the first of those two, then you create this world of pain. Mm. The other thing is it causes poaching at the top of those minority communities. Mm -hmm. So the best people within those communities, they'll be highly vied for, fought over, but the people who are not as proficient or adept or lack those skill sets, what happens to them? And then don't you think that there's something that's alienating socially that someone would say, well, they're only in that position because they're in certain immutable characteristics? Oh, sure. And the, think about how one would feel as a talented black person, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is... Um, I mean, it's unbelievably humiliating and insulting. This, this is one of my many reasons for objecting to all of this, which is that it makes everyone suspicious of everyone else. It means that everybody who is in a particular position, their colleagues might be weighing them up as to whether or not they were right. a diversity hire or not. Right. Somebody once pointed out to me that when, at an American university in the 1960s or 70s, when you saw a, a black student colleague, if you were white, you knew that student was damn right, mm. you know. Because among much else, they'd had to mm. get through more hoops. Right. And then you get to the current status, and the same person said, they couldn't help thinking that exactly the reverse right. might be the case. And couple that with the fact that they could never say that. So yeah. we have many, many people who are thinking that, and it's festering, and mm -hmm. it's festering, and they're thinking that. And I happen to believe, I don't know if you believe this, but I happen to think that there's no such thing as a private belief. If you intensely believe something, like, mm -hmm. well, and you can't speak about it, you can't engage in yes. a dialogue, because then you could be accused of being a Nazi or racist. But you're thinking, well, geez, why is that black person in that situation? Are they affirmative actioned in? I can't help but to think the inevitable consequence of that would be you would treat them differently. And that is a stain yeah. on all of us. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and then you get the problem of the hierarchies that you create in the name of justice right. that simply create greater inequality. Right. I mean, inequality is more of a concern to the political left than it is to the political right for all sorts of reasons. But such as there is an argument about it, this game, the identity politics game, is a horrible place to address inequality because you get the problems 
that I, I, I identify as being, for instance, a board or a university needs to improve its black or female or LGBT quota. The people they're likely to get that they're going to reach out to are, for instance, the woman who was about to be promoted anyway, or highly likely to be promoted anyway. The already very well educated black student, or indeed, in many of these cases, an already very privileged in economic terms student. I say this in my own country as being the issue of reaching out for diversity and getting a black old Etonian. <laughs> um, Interesting. What have you actually done in this other than create what appears to be a diverse board or a diverse student body or a diverse workforce? When in actual fact, all you have done is just create a new privileged, if in one way, diverse class of person. And you've got, for instance, zero class mobility, no working class representation at all. Or you get to the stage where you have no viewpoint diversity because everybody is essentially from the same relatively privileged milieu. Why do you think people are so hoodwinked by this? Because it's an answer to a number of very big questions. In the gap left by religion, it's an answer to the question of what should we be doing with our lives on earth? That's a good question to address. And if you say, or anyone says, I have the answer. I know what you should be doing. I know what you should be doing. Fighting for social justice. You should be fighting for social justice. You sh you, you, it's a reason to get up in the morning. It's a reason to go out campaigning in the afternoon. And it's a reason to fight over the dinner table and um, tell your family that they're bigots. Oh. This is um, this is purpose of a kind. And and by the way, sorry, one other thing, which is of course it it says. I mean, this is the real attraction. It says in a quasi-religious manner. In fact, it's better than religion, isn't it? Because religion says if you sort these things out, then in a life to come, you will find um, salvation. And the social justice activists and the intersectionists and the much more say, if you do all of these things, we can get justice here on earth. And who wouldn't want that if it was able to be achieved and if it was offered to you? I mean, the appeal of it is, is extraordinary because here is, I mean, the, the world is wildly unequal, may well always be, I think probably always will be, unequal in lots of ways. It's unfair in a huge variety of ways. Our own lives all bear out that experience. We know it collectively as well as individually. And, and these are all things we rail against or find peace against in our lives, as, as the case is. But if somebody comes along and says, no, we could solve all unfairness, inequality, inequity. You've just got to join us. Ordinarily, that's said by a cult. Sounds very Baptist to me. It's, it's, it's highly Baptist. It has so many resonances from the religious tradition, which is why I say I think it's trodden into that gap. Mm. So one of the reasons I think people are so hoodwinked, I think they're hoodwinked by language. I think they're hoodwinked by these words. Equity sounds really good. Mm. Inclusion sounds really good. Diversity sounds really good. Safe space sounds really good. All of these words mm. sound good. And most people, they don't really know what they mean. It sounds good and it makes them feel good. Yes. I mean, just think, anti-racism. Mm. Yeah, who's not on board with that? If you have, don't know the moral underpinnings of that are Black Lives Matter. Well, of course Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the, uh, a movement with literally no open opposition. And they, got, they hoodwink you through those words. And the people say, I think it was Linda Sarsour who put, who put out a tweet, Antifa, anti-fascist, that's all you need. What more to, is it than that? Yes. It, it is the power of language. Mm -hmm. There must be something in the brain's architecture or some evolutionary quirk or something that makes us susceptible to these things. Well, in-group, out-group is, is the obvious one, is that it's, it's, once this stuff 
becomes the dominant theme of the time. Once, once people agree on the reprehensible nature of racism, homophobia, bigotry, misogyny, once they agree on that, then of course they want to be on the side of right. the people opposed to all of that. The problem is and you jump onto the side of all the people who are opposed to all that and you discover they can do things as wicked as anyone else. Right. But one other interesting thing about that is that you mentioned language. And of course, I've always thought that one of the great advantages that any profession of faith or professed ideology has, strangely enough, is if, if it looks more complex than it is. Um, I think a lot of people have been intellectually intimidated by the studies movements, by the grievance industry, by the intersectionalists. They, they feel intellectually intimidated by it because the language these people write in is far more complex than the really right. rather simple ideas they actually espouse. Right. There's never a word they use that they don't add syllables to unnecessarily. You know, problem, a problem is never a problem. It is a problematization. Mm. You never have a narrative. You always have a meta-narrative. Mm. And this is the case in every single term. Everything is made to sound more complex than it is, which, by the way, as a writer, annoys me because I believe the task of writing is to try to take the most complex ideas and make them simpler, or at least simpler to understand than they might otherwise be. And here are a whole set of academics in particular who take really rather straightforward and simple assertions, which we could all understand, and they make them impossible to understand. They use such deliberately right. difficult language. And I think a lot of people before that, you know, people whose children return from college and spout this stuff, a lot of people, particularly parents, become intellectually intimidated by it. I think that it's the same thing with all of the implicit bias stuff and all that. You know, your boss tells you to do something that you feel isn't right. Right. But they've they've got a whole language to explain it and you don't really understand it and you you go along with it because you think you must be dumb. And you're not dumb. You're the cleverer person in the room if you've seen through that. But there's, there's not much to help you. Very few people are going to reach out. And there's a terrible opportunity cost if you're accused of all sorts of terrible things for even questioning it. The question about the parallels to religion is so interesting to mm. me. So obviously we have, to be woke is to be born again. Blasphemy and political correctness, certain speech codes, the mechanism of enforcement there. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent people from saying certain things? Well, we have inclusion. We have certain apparatus, instead of apparatus of the state, we have the apparatus of the university system, for example, that we can, we can punish wrongdoers. What parallels between wokeism as a religion, and, and either traditional religions do you see, or do you think that wokeism is a religion? I think it's got all of the preconditions necessary to identify it as a religion. It, it doesn't yet have an overtly clerical class, but it's not far off. It, it, it's, it's very clever. I didn't think that after the main monotheism started to drift away as they did in recent decades, perhaps you might say recent centuries, I didn't think it was possible to come up with a brand new religion. But wokeism is about the best shot anyone has given it so far to come up with something original. And, and of course, it borrows so much from the religion of the society which it's come up in. You know, it borrows the Christian conception of guilt. The, the difficulty of which is that uh, it might be guilt without redemption mm, for many exactly. people. Exactly, no redemption. No there. redemption. Yeah. I was, I was, of course, it was sitting in Portland. I was, I was almost moved the other day at the courthouse to see that one of the massive bits of graffiti over the entirely graffiti-covered building said "Repent." Wow, that's a that's a heck of a thing to see back. And and repent for things you haven't even done. Mm -hmm. And and. Um, and pick up the religious right. uh, traditions of how to repent. Right. I mean, um, uh, here in Portland, there have been, for instance, 
Ceremonies where white people prostrate themselves in the street in front of black people. I was speaking to somebody uh, yesterday who, who, who was at one of these events and said that he didn't join in because he felt there was something a little off about it. But you're damn right there is. Have you seen this stuff too? Which one's that? Where they raise their hands and they... But instead of the Holy Spirit, they're raising their hands in front of black people. Ah, I hadn't seen that one. I thought the other one was the, um, the borrowing of the uh, Ashra tradition in Shia Islam, uh, oh, where the, you yeah. flay yourself. And there have been sites in recent months of white people flaying themselves in right. the street. And actually, in, in one famous video, um, black Americans coming rushing over to them saying, stop this. <laughs> we don't want you to do this. Right. We never asked for this. What are right. you doing? Quite rightly. But, uh, I mean, these are all, this is all what happens when people stagger around an ideological wasteland looking for, looking for things to latch onto and, and, and remembering traditions that you might have thought have been lost. And they want meaning. Meaning. Yeah. And they're, they're kind of a little bit too, I want to say savvy, but to people walking on water, to Muhammad flying to heaven on a winged horse, that's, we realize that's largely silly. Mm. by now but racism is real mm. it's, it's also interesting to me that love the sin hate the sinner that, that you could we're all guilty of original sin and privilege is the original sin James Lindsay and I wrote a piece of that in 2016 mm. you can have an entire system in which nobody's racist but the whole system is racist yes and that to me is a fascinating concept one of the ways we measure that is that we look at outcomes, the disparities in outcomes. So, I, I don't know, I've just been lingering on something that you said about, in the old religions, you have a better life, better afterlife. But this is even more wicked than that, because there is, the work is never done. There is no amelioration. There, there is no, or maybe there's just a minor gradation of, solving the problem but the problem is perpetual it's perennial it's deep rooted and every single person has to actively work and we see this in education we have to actively work constantly to find racism and if you can't find racism in a situation it's your problem that's mm -hmm. your it's very similar to sin mm -hmm. except similar in that they're both imaginary but it's different in that eventually you can find the sin. Yes. And of course, uh, at least with the Christian concept of sin, you also have the concept of hating the sin but loving the sinner. Right. In this scenario, you hate the sin and the sinner. So here's my question to you. Do, do you think, and I fully admit I have struggled with this tremendously, do you think we're all better off as a society with a benevolent form of Christianity or with wokeism as we see it today? Oh, I much prefer the old gods to the new ones. Don't you? So yeah, do yeah, I. Yeah. You knew where you were with them. Right. Um, the system was transparent. They valued dialogue. They had a correspondence theory of truth. What you said corresponded to something mm. in reality. There, there was a way to redeem yourself. Mm. I mean, it's a fascinating situation in which I, it's the substitution hypothesis. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that people need something to believe. Yeah. And as religion in general, and Christianity in particular, has been on the decline, something has substituted or come in for that. And what that something is, maybe people don't know the word intersectionality mm -hmm. or the term it's a critical race theory, but it's those ideas that have come in and substituted for ideas that have have a long pedigree in Western culture. Yeah, and I do think that we may be far better off as a, as a society with benevolent forms of Christianity as opposed to the new religion, which is just wickedness. Yeah, I mean the problem is, of course, we don't have a choice in a way. I mean these. We're all, to some extent, flotsam and jetsam on the larger tide. 
one couldn't bring back a form of benevolent Christianity uh. simply by willing it or saying that the alternatives are bad. Uh. You know, um, we are where we are because history happened. And, uh. and there is something though about about somebody who's very religious, and they see you and they say you're a sinner, or they see me and they say you're going to go to hell. I've never respected that belief, but I've always respected that person. I've always yeah. respected the forthright speech that they have, the fact that they commu- they'll stand at you, they'll look you in the eye, they'll say that to you. I don't see that with the new religion. I see screaming, cr- cry bullies. I- yes, because it sets up problems which it cannot answer. I mean, that's, that's the big problem, isn't it? Cr- cr- Christianity sets up problems which it answers. Right. You have the fall of man, and then you have the redemption of man. You have the first Adam, and then you have the second. Mm. The real long-term evil of the woke ideology is, among much else, that it sets up problems which it cannot answer. For instance, I'm very interested in, as you know, in the theological and philosophical problem of forgiveness. Mm which I think is one of the most important things to think about in any society. And you bet it's got to be the thing we've got to think about in a society where you've got social media and young people making mistakes in view of the whole damn world, you know, just to not think about forgiveness in a society like that is to set up an awful lot of people for very thwarted and unhappy lives. So it, it preoccupies me quite a lot. But here's the thing. If you just take one aspect of the woke ideology, the problem, for instance, of being a cis, heterosexual, white male, what is the redemption mechanism for that? They don't know, other than shut up, sit down, let everyone else speak. There's no way out of it other than that. Silence, which isn't a solution. Take another one. Historical guilt. I mean, I've, I've written about this in two books now. You know, historical guilt is a very, very tricky concept. The sins of the father being meted out onto the son goes back to the Christian comparison. The Christian religion says the sins of the father cannot be visited on the son. And the woke religion says, no, the, the sins of his great, great, great grandfather must be visited right. on the great, 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 great grandson. And how do you ex- and how do you expunge it? You can't. Never, never. That uh, seems to me an especially wicked setup. I want to go back to something you said about forgiveness. Hmm. I think my own view is that sooner or later, this ideology is going to be exposed as the fraudulent sham it is, and the people who have been hoodwinked by it are going to be utterly enraged. And what we need to do is to welcome back, to forgive the proponents, the race grifters, who've gotten us into this fucking mess, Mm. and welcome them back into the very society they're they're attempting to dismantle. So I think Mm. these people need to be forgiven. There aren't many ways in which people can belong. People can belong by religious affiliation, national affiliation. You've got family, you might say clan or tribe. Uh, The woke ideology says you can affiliate by sexual orientation, gender, sex and race. We all know the problems, or we're starting to know the problems that can come from that. The problem underneath this in terms of answering this question is we are all very familiar of the ways in which national belonging can go wrong. We should be better at knowing how racial belonging can go wrong Mm. in every direction. The obvious answer to all of this nevertheless lies in the other forms of belonging that exist. Mm. In lieu of racial belonging, uh, uh, or in lieu of religious belonging, which you may come and go, it'll ebb and flow, the most obvious answer to all of this stuff is national belonging. And by the way, I, I wouldn't give up on that entirely. Hmm. Um, really? 
Yeah, I especially wouldn't give up on it in America. But you, you are from a small island. Well, it's not that small. And yet... Um, I mean, Crete, Crete is small. <laughs> well, Malta is small. The United Kingdom but, is not. It's but yet you... Uh, <laughs> 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 but yet we're friends and you're sitting here and we're hanging out and mm. we eat sushi. Yeah. And so that, that like transcend... But the transcendent part of that, of the relationship is... I would say it's a love of truth. We have yeah. commonalities. We have we should. No, well, none of this is to say that, the, that that these things can't transcend nation. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that that, uh, as the late Roger Scruton said, that the national belonging is 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 the widest possible application of the first person plural. It's, it's the widest possible application of we. Feeling um, belonging in things that your nation has done, even if you've not had any role in it. Uh, belonging, even maybe when your ancestors weren't in this nation, mm. but you still feel a sense of we about the nation. The reason I say, by the way, that I, I wouldn't give up on that in America in particular is that the American ideal, many of the American ideals, do have the c capacity, the capability, even if it's a flawed one, to transcend racial, sexual, and other right. lines. Because you can say, it doesn't matter what race you are. I mean, again, it's, people will say this hasn't happened historically, and I'd concede much of But you have the ability in this country to say, look, it doesn't matter what damn gender, sexual orientation, or race you are, we're Americans. Uh, th that, that seems to me not to be something that should be given up lightly or given up on lightly. Mm. It, it is one very good answer to that, to say we are equal under the law, for instance. What a wonderful aspiration, even if it's not always perfect in practice or exactly mm. met in practice. But my point is, is that since there are very limited r ways to belong in groups larger than the family or the circle of friends, we, we should revisit and think about all of these things. And the only reason we don't is because we know all of the ways in which they can go wrong. But as I always remind people, everything can go wrong. Mm. I mean, you know, love can go wrong. Love can cause wars. Love started the Trojan Wars. We don't try to ban love. We don't, we don't remain totally suspicious of love as a consequence of that. Why can't we accept that everything can go wrong, including racial affiliation, gender affiliation, mm. national affiliation, but they can also be the tools to get some things right. Mm. And belonging in a nation, it would seem to me, certainly in America, mm. is a way to suppress some of these battles is, is to try to get beyond them again uh, and not to split apart over them. And what I, as a, obviously a non-American, but as a lover and admirer of this country, think is that it's so sad that so many Americans seem to be giving up on that unifying ideal. I think that ideal is the shining city on the hill. Mm. Mm. I think that ideal is what America ought to stand for and, and I think that's what's so difficult to me to see not only the physical acts of violence mm. and uh, physical acts of vandalism, but the intellectual vandalism mm. perpetrated by this. Yeah. And, and I don't think that this is a large number of true believers. I think we're looking at a fringe percentage of the population in which they've sucked in a lot of these people to, to have the police. But I want to go back and I want to answer that question directly. So. My response to that would be, it's not a very glorious response, but, but it's a true one. You have to attend meetings. Mm -hmm. You have to show up at your workplace when they're having these conversations. Mm -hmm. You have to know what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And when you engage these ideas, the first order of business is for you to learn about them. Yeah. Your books have been fantastic. But it's even beyond learning about them. Different people have different skill sets. You're a writer, you're a world famous writer. You can bring a certain skill set to this that other people can't. Maybe some people are artists. Are you an artist? I'm not. Less. Okay, well then you can't yeah. bring that skill set. Yeah. So maybe some people can do memes, they can Absolutely. do art. And maybe some people are not artists and they're not writers and they're terrified to speak before people, but they have some financial means. So maybe they want to make a financial contribution. But make some kind of a contribution mm. and know what it is that you're making a contribution mm. to. My other response to that is the Greek value of parahesia. 
speaking truth in the face of danger. Mm -hmm. We cannot be held hostage to the delusions of other people. Yeah. We cannot be held hostage to the irrationality and dangerous divisive nature of this ideology. Everybody can say the truth as they see it. Everyone can raise concerns whenever they see them. Nobody should be silent. Nobody should feel intimidated. Nobody should put up with being bullied. Not in a free society. In a totalitarian society, in a dictatorship, sure, people have to put up with being bullied. They don't have to put up with it in America. They really don't have to put up with it. So, when somebody in your workplace says, you must read these books, Ask why. Mm. And uh, ask them if they insist you read them. And, and there are government agencies in my country that have insisted the workforce read the following improving texts. Say, OK, if this is an exchange of ideas, I'm willing to have an exchange of ideas. Here's some books I think you should read. Let's do a swap. We can have a book discussion. Uh, if Give them the madness of crowds. I, I couldn't say it myself. But um, uh, uh, if... Your child is at school and they're being taught racial bias stuff. If they're being told that they're intrinsically racist, take your child out of the school or go to the school and say, I will not have racism taught to my child. Not in any direction. You don't get to do it. Now, if enough people did that, it would stop. It would mm. stop. I have versions of the words people should use. Say to people trying to do this, I will not take part in the re-racialization of my society. I will not. If you want to do it, you can do it to your kids and they will suffer the poison from it. Not my kids, not on my turf. If every parent who was worried about this did that, it would stop. It would stop tomorrow. The reason it doesn't is because of intimidation. Fear. Fear. People are afraid. And you know, they, there are lots of reasons historically for people to be afraid. But in America today, it isn't easy for people. I don't by any means underestimate this. But it's better than at any time in history to voice what you know to be true. I think m my answer is much simpler. It's to show up. You have to show up. Mm. You have to show up and you have to pay attention and you have to really understand what people are talking about. And ask questions if you don't understand. Mm. I would say the first thing to do is <clears throat> don't even challenge at all. Just ask questions. Well, what, what does that mean? What, what do you mean when you use the word equity? What does it mean to have an inclusive space? Because an inclusive space ultimately means that you have to have a speech restriction. Because mm. if you didn't, it wouldn't be, people wouldn't feel welcome and then they wouldn't feel that they're included in the space. So I think, I think it's important to show up, ask questions, be on the same page about what people mean about words. And I know that that must sound academic, but it's mm. not. Because that's one of the ways that people are being fooled by this, is that they're being, we're being beholden to these words that we don't know what they mean. Well, of course, there should be equity in a school system. Really? Well, what do, you, what do you mean by equity? The other thing I think people should do is you're absolutely correct. People will be ridiculed or they'll be treated with derision if they question the, this dominant moral orthodoxy. And I think what they have to do is to not be intimidated by people who do that. Mm. And among the ways that you can do that is you can find people who have similar views. You can go online. In person, of course, it's, it's difficult now. But I think as long as you have an ability and a sincere ability in yourself to be willing to revise the beliefs that you have, mm. to be willing to change your beliefs, even if the people with whom you're talking don't have that, I think that is a way for you to take the legitimate moral high ground. Mm. Mm. And not just moral high ground, but an intellectual high ground too. What else do you think people can do to fight back? To say, you know, when people have had, an, either if they've had enough already, or they're, they're seeing it rise like the frog in the water. 
the, the frog in the boiling water. Do, do you have that mm-hmm. expression on the island? Okay, so there. <laughs> we have frogs. Okay. We can, we can okay. even boil water. I don't know if you had stove. We mastered the boiling water. I don't know if you had stove technology, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah. okay. We're uh, there. So, so hmm. what? What? <laughs> <laughs> this interview might be over very quickly. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 do people do if they they've either let me here's what I really want to say. What do people do before they've had enough? they they see the writing on the wall. Mm. What do they do? First thing is to trust their instincts. Mm. Trust their instincts and know that if there's something that makes them uncomfortable, it isn't because what's happening is true, but because what's happening may be false. Mm. Everything says to them, if you are uncomfortable, that's good. Mm. Actually, your instincts will tell you, I'm uncomfortable about that thing happening. Quite often it's because the thing that is happening is wrong. Trust your instincts right. on and these things. It's really interesting. I would say, trust your doubts too. Yes, oh, absolutely. And, and test them out and test them out against other people's. Organize, definitely. Uh, group, speak up. And I mean, people also need to know the, simple short, the simplest shortcuts mm. to try to undermine the reprehensibly de- demoralizing and divisive things of the time. I suggest a number in the manners of crowds at the end. One is, one of the simplest and most effective is just to always say, compared to what? What exactly are you comparing us to? If you say we live in a racist society, compared to what? Compared to where? Right. Uh, name your country. Name your country. If you say at this point we are living in X situation, compared to what? Mm. What, what historic situation is it that you would like us to be aiming right. for? And on that... Note, I would say when you do have these conversations, keep your cool. Oh, gosh, yes. Keep your cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, because invariably, if people choose to have those conversations with you across that divide, they are not keeping their cool. No, I've, well, I've noticed that. And, and most of the time, it's because they've come from a university system where they've never heard those ideas. So they're, in, they're brittle. And yes. so when they first hear them... Yes, and I'd also add that... The work ideology, like all ideologies that claims to be totalistic and comprehensive, has massive advantages because it tells people what they should be doing with their lives and it tells them the meaning of life and it gives them purpose and much more as we describe. But it's also wildly simplistic. Mm. It's both simultaneously both highly complex and wildly simplistic. And my own view is that, among other things, we need to, to reacquaint ourselves with the the real complexity of life, Mm. which is that people are complex, that we are not in an existential fight between the children of light and the children of darkness. It isn't an endless replay of the 1930s in which you are the anti-Nazi and everyone on the other side is the Nazi. Mm. It's more complex than that, and it runs through all of us. That's that's why I particularly mind the cult-like thing of saying, you know, if your parents don't agree with you or your camp grandparents don't agree with you, cut them off, cut off relations right. with them. Apart from the fact that that is a cult behavior, pure and simple. It ignores one of the most important lessons in life, which is people you love will think differently from you. And that's okay. And that's in fact, okay. That's probably good, Can ultimately. Can you imagine how boring the world would be if mm. everybody you loved and met in your life all thought exactly the same as you. It shouldn't be the the aspiration. It shouldn't be the desire. Sure, we can agree on things that we, on some basic standards, but other than that, you know, you'll lose elections, you'll win elections, your guy will win, your guy will lose. And more often than not, if somebody has a different belief, if someone holds a different belief, it's not because they're a bad person. Yeah. It's either because they have different starting information yes. or maybe they know something you don't know. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's one of the most important lessons, isn't it? Assume it's possible that the person you're dealing with, particularly, I have to say, an older person you're dealing mm. with, may know something you don't, may know something about the world that you don't. Mm. It's such an important thing for people to realize and to realize, as you say, as you, it's such an important point, is that, they, that people who think differently from you do not necessarily think differently from you because of malign motives. Right. 
And, and in that case, that's really interesting to find out why they think the way they do. And you may discover that you know, the, the, the worst case scenario is that, you know, you have a different view and the fact that they think differently helps you realize why you think as you think. Best case scenario is if they're right and you're wrong, you should learn fast right. that that's the case. So if you are setting up a system in which you believe you're solving every inequity on earth and actually you're creating hell, you should find out about it fast. You should find out about it fast. Don't waste a day more of your life on this crap. And don't make people around you who love you and who you love suffer because you've given in to a cult-like right. behavior. And we've created that exact system. We have agents of misery everywhere. Absolutely. And you know, just one other thing on that is, we should realize this is not what we should spend our lives doing. Right. You know, we live at the most fortunate time in human history. We have access to almost all of the world's information on a tiny device in our pockets. We can listen to the world's music, read the world's texts, communicate to people on any other continent on the planet at any time we choose. The idea that we're spending these years talking about race and character traits, we could work out how to live on Mars in this time. We shouldn't be wasting this time. We should be using it well.